Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on loads. We are moving to section two, subsection three on occupancy loads, which are one example of live loads. The other one we mentioned are things like vehicles on parking deck levels. Um, typically we design a building by looking at applied loads like live load or snow load. And those of course go on the top of whatever member we're sizing. Uh, we then add dead load of decking and then typically we also add the dead load of the beam or spanning member itself which initially may be estimated because we don't know what it is until we've sized it. Uh, in the case of computer simulations we will just get a, guess at a size and the computer will do the analysis and the results will come back and tell us whether it's right or not and then we can change it. Um, but the whole issue of, of this design process is it's iterative because you, you design for, for example, the applied loads, such as the occupancy load and the dead load of the decking, and you get a certain uh, dead load for the beam, and then you throw the dead load of the beam into the loads that it has to support, and you may have to redesign it slightly to get it to account for its own weight. Typically, the dead load of the beam is pretty easy to estimate in the case of steel. It's like 5% or less of the weight on top. Concrete is a less efficient material, and often the dead weight of the beam is a very substantial uh, portion of its load. Um, this dead load actually doesn't exist on the top of the beam. This would be the self-load of the beam, and it's actually distributed through the beam, but for simplicity, we just put it on top of the beam. Uh, the same as we deal with the dead load of the decking or the occupancy load. We do the same thing for trusses as we do for beams. And if we have higher applied loads, we'll typically have larger decking loads and then the dead load of the structure itself will be higher. But our estimation techniques will be pretty much the same. We'll know roughly what percentage of the total load that the spanning member is and we'll try to account for that so that we don't have to do any more iterations than necessary in the sizing process. Uh, we could account for the highly distributed load. So here we're basically saying we're going to throw the dead load of the truss up on the top of the truss. But actually that dead load is distributed through the truss. And if we were being absolutely vigorous, rigorous, we would do this. We would put the self-weight of the truss members on the truss members themselves. Uh, typically in the past we've not done this because the self-weight of the truss members is really low. Um, but in fact, if we're doing a computer simulation, it automatically does this because we assign a certain weight member to that web member and that web member and to the top cord and the bottom cord and the computer automatically associates that self-weight with those members. So we actually do this kind of rigorous calculation in the computer, but when we're doing hand calculations, we just take an estimate of what all the self-weight of the truss is, and we put all that on the top cord. And generally speaking, that turns out to be a pretty accurate uh, computational method. Okay, so the question becomes, where do we get live loads? And these are included in the code. And I've shown here some typical numbers. These numbers vary from time to time as the codes get debated and rewritten. But the numbers that I'm giving here are pretty indicative. So for assembly halls and auditoriums and churches, where you have fixed seats, you should account for 60 pounds a square foot. Um, so that would be this number here. What's interesting is if you have movable seats, you actually have to account for more than that. And the reason is that people might jam the seats closer together, or they might take the seats out all together and um, sort of stand. And in the standing position, they're not taking up as much space. They could stand closer together. You'd have higher loads. Um, and, and then people do screwy things on top of that, like they sway back and forth or they do the bunny hop. And so we tend to take fairly conservative numbers, like 100 pounds per square foot. Um, 
if a 200 pound person is standing in a space that's that crowded, that person has literally two square feet to stand on. So when you visualize what that's like, people are basically chest to chest and shoulder to shoulder. It's extremely rare that we'd ever get that kind of density in a space, but I can tell you I have experienced it. In fact, I remember the last time I went to the Sistine Chapel, there was one tiny door leading out and the people who were exiting that space would crowd around that door and we were literally chest to back and shoulder to shoulder over a fairly substantial floor area. So you shouldn't take these things lightly, no pun intended. When it says 100 pounds a square foot, you have to design for that. If that's what the code says, you absolutely have no choice except to design for that. And the last thing in the world you ever want to do is to say, well, I don't think that load will ever be reached, so I'm going to ignore that. You simply don't, you don't ignore the code unless you want to leave yourself open to all manner of legal action. All right, so restaurants, gymnasiums, grandstands are also designed to 100 pounds a square foot and uh, restaurants you can clear them out people might be dancing there they might be doing the bunny hop the same is true of gymnasiums and of course grandstands are classic places where people are stomping up and down uh, sometimes in unison and they're also very densely packed so uh, these numbers are pretty serious uh, in theaters in aisles and lobbies it's 100 but on balconies it's only 60 because typically there's fixed seating and you don't have a major party going on on the balcony. On stage floors, it's even worse because you have to design potentially for tremendously weighty sets and other equipment that might go there. In business facilities, we typically design for 80 pounds a square foot for offices, 100 pounds a square foot for office corridors. If we don't know where the corridors are gonna be, we may have to design the entire spec office building to withstand 100 pounds a square foot. Document storage systems have been rated at 200. I can tell you actually that if you're smart, you probably make that number 250, and you can test this out if you have enough um, um, architectural records. Just uh, put a stack of those six or eight feet high, which is how high those document cabinets sometimes go, and it will weigh over 200 pounds a square foot. Uh, library stacks are 150 pounds a square foot, and the list goes on. So let's jump down to some common situations that you might be designing for. Um, a private dwelling, for example, is 40 pounds a square foot. And that's for the main floor. It's listed here as first floor, but that really should mean main floor. So that's wherever entry occurs. For the non-main floors, which typically for most situations means upper floors you design for a reduced load of 30 pounds a square foot because typically you don't have really dense parties on the non-main floor and then of course for uninhabitable attics you can get away with 20. you don't want to do that though if you ever think that you're going to inhabit that attic you want to design it for at least 30 pounds a square foot for multi-family dwellings it's 40 pounds a square foot and for the corridors in such dwellings, it's 60 pounds a square foot. Okay, so that's the load that gets distributed on top of the trusses. And to first order, you can and should do an analysis assuming that load is everywhere on that floor. Um, so always you have to account for the potential of that load being everywhere. You also have to account though for its potential to not be everywhere it might be, for example, concentrated on one side. So we might be having a party in this building where this side is fully loaded, but this side is not. And that actually can produce worse load problems for certain parts of this truss. For example, it's not uncommon at the center of the truss where we presume we have shear force, uh, zero shear, shear across that truss, because the two sides, this side right here, is in equilibrium under all those forces. That side's in equilibrium under all those forces. And there's no tendency for this side to go up relative to that or to go down. 
So in other words, there's no shear occurring in the center bay. And sometimes we leave out the web member there so that we can run ductwork through that square opening. The problem with that is we might end up with load like this, in which case this portion is only in equilibrium if there's some kind of major shear force being transferred across the interface between this side and this side. So we can have some major deformation occurring in that square opening and we need to do our analysis to deal with that. And just to give you an example, this shows such a situation where this central square bay all along has been left open to run ductwork through. And to first order, we don't expect that to be a huge problem. But if we had a party where this whole side of the building was heavily loaded and nothing was happening on that side, we'd have shear racking occurring in this zone. And we'd have to make sure that the cord members could handle the bending forces or the bending stresses that would occur from that. So this is uh, assuming this building was designed, assuming these trusses would span all the way across this 26 feet. And you'll notice there's an opening in the floor right there for the stairs from the first floor down to the basement. And this shows that opening. And you'll notice that on this floor, they have framed out with two by 12s that are spanning uh, 14 feet on this side and those are delivering fairly major loads to this beam and this beam right here is a flitch beam it's got a 2 by 12 on each side and a steel plate down the middle and that beam is coming to this point and delivering all of its load so it's accumulating load out of all these uh, joists those are all going into this girder this girder is delivering its load to that column that column is delivering all of its loads to down below. And if we trace that down, this is that column right there. And they've done several things really wrong in this case. The first thing is you don't want a huge load like that coming down in the middle of your top cord member, which is laying flat in this configuration because we're inducing bending, which is tending to damage that web member and if I think it's probably visible from here but if not I can tell you that at the time I took this photograph when you sighted along this top cord this portion right here was pretty dramatically dishing out. The other thing that is apparent here is that this thing is racking and that it's in getting a deformation of that sort which is inducing bending stress and in fact a better depiction is that it comes along and does this kind of thing. So it's deforming in that manner, which is inducing those bending stresses. So this is a classic case where an asymmetric load is inducing serious problems in this center zone of this truss. So at the time I went to observe this building, this truss had already sagged an inch and a half relative to the one adjacent to it and the floor was sloping an inch and a half between those two uh, and they were only 12 inches apart they were closely spaced and so the slope in the plywood was pretty dramatic and the plywood was beginning to show stress in terms of some splinters uh, appearing and some some obvious apparent bending stress occurring in it and when I spoke to the builder about it, uh, he uh, obviously turned out was very confused. He says, there can't be anything wrong with these trusses because we got them from a manufacturer that has an in-house engineer. And I asked him the name and it turned out that that particular truss manufacturer did not have an in-house engineer. So they had called the engineer and they had basically said, you know, we have trusses that are spanning 26 feet. They're 24 inches or 16 inches on center or whatever the standard spacing was they were using at that time. Uh, and they asked the engineer to size it. So the manufacturer then called the engineer and the engineer sized it. And so the, uh, as I was talking to the builder, I said, well, let me put this another way. I said, you have this huge force that's coming down on this one truss. 
and that truss is already showing evidence of being in distress. And that took the builder back for a moment and he was kind of quiet. And then he said, no, there's not any problem because this truss was designed by an engineer. So after a while I said, let me put it another way. If that truss can handle this enormous force, that means all your other trusses are over-designed by a factor of 10. Well, that, at that point he began to show some signs of being disconcerted and he eventually went away and came back the next day and I discovered that they had built a stud wall up underneath here. But what was more striking was these plates were beginning to work off the face and they had jammed a two by four in here. So they were trying to take all the loads out of this big fat column through this two by four and the irony was they didn't have another two by four underneath it. Instead of that, they had a two by four over here and a two by four over there. And they were hoping that the stud wall that they were building underneath this would somehow take this enormous force, which was highly concentrated and there was no material underneath to absorb that. So this is a long lesson and uh, don't assume your builder knows what he's doing. Don't believe the trust manufacturer when they say they have an in-house engineer because they may not and you'll want to follow up. But the last thing you want to do is to do something really dumb like right there you're spanning the entire distance with trusses. The next floor up you change the system. So instead of having trusses that are spanning all the way across here and carrying all the load associated with that floor, those loads are being carried by these joists to this girder and down that column to a single truss down below. The last thing in the world you want to take is a series of trusses like that are, that were designed to absorb a distributed load and put some super concentrated load like that on it. So no engineer was ever told about this column load here because they never would have approved that. The other point I want to make is to get back to the primary point of this discussion. Uh, live load or an asymmetric load on a truss like this creates distress at the center. So this truss would need to be analyzed for all these cases for the partial load and for the full load. And it would have to perform satisfactorily under both this full distributed load and this partial distributed load. And it's the job of the design team to look at the structure and figure out what partial loading of the live load is going to produce really negative effects that have to be accounted for in the design of that member. You have to be kind of a negative thinker in that you're saying, what's the worst thing that can happen? And that's what we have to make it work for because it has to be safe under all loads. Okay, so here is one more example of a live load case. In this case, we've got uh, cantilevered beams coming off. So we have continuous beams and you'll notice we're showing a deformation in the dash dashed line. So it's down on the ends over the center here. It's neutral. Then it goes down in between then it comes back up and goes down again. So if I was going to draw this in a really exaggerated way, I'd draw it like this. That's the nature of the deformation. Um, so in this case, all of these cantilevers are moving down on the end, or, or they, if they're the right length, they might be moving up slightly but they're all moving together because every floor is loaded in the same way. Now, suppose we have this situation where we say it's Christmas time and all these people are concentrated on this floor at the center because they're having a Christmas party. On the other hand, there's a beautiful sunset outside and all the people on all the other floors have accumulated in the perimeter spaces. And there's nothing going on in the middle here to hold this down. So now we're getting pretty radical deformation downward out of these floors, but this floor is actually moving upward because of the effect of uh, the live load of all these people in the center. So 
this spacing right here is increasing and the glass is falling out on pedestrians down below. This is decreasing and the glass is being crushed and shattered and is falling on the pedestrians down below. So this is generally not a good situation. So one of the things you have to keep track of is, first of all, cantilevers that have glass at the ends are highly problematical. But second of all, one of the big problems associated with them is this issue of shifting load, where you can have live load here, or you can have it out there, and that can occur in a completely random way over time. And you have to account, or someone on your team has to account for all the movement that occurs out here. And then, so your engineer may say, well, here's the extreme variation in that opening. And then you as the architect have to design a glazing system that will accommodate that much movement. If you'd like to see an example of a really, really beautiful building like this, you can check out the Pirelli building by Pierluigi Nervi. Um, you will discover that it has beautifully tapered concrete cantilevers, very similar to this, except much more sculpturally rich, but one of the things you'll discover when you see it is that these cantilevers are really quite dramatically deep. And that's because Nervi understood that if these cantilevers aren't really stiff, he's going to have problems with the glazing out there. So that, that uh, concludes our discussion for the moment of occupancy loads. So we have now addressed dead loads or fixed loads and occupancy loads of people in the buildings.